the Indonesia to conduct master's degree in chemistry teaching program in Taipei. This is her lecture experience conducting research on biochemistry, biotechnology, and bioinformatics field, hiring students to help doing the research and supervising them, teaching several courses in bioinformatics, computational chemistry, biotechnology, general chemistry, organic chemistry, and English for chemists. And this is the research experience. Meta analysis of NAT2 and anti tuberculosis drug induced liver injury. And then I was a training workshop, seminar. Yeah, this is the organization of the experience. Okay, so without further ado, let's call upon our moderator today to join us on stage. Ms. Helia Cusaro, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, my job here is to introduce Professor Angela Fuller and to uh, lead the discussion for the public lecture. So I'm going to introduce you to uh, Professor Carla Kohler. Thank you so much. So Professor Carla Kohler is, uh, was graduated from Iowa State University for uh, BS, Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, and PhD from Iowa State University. And then she has been a faculty member in biochemistry division of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry for 15 years at UCLA and have been promoted to professor. Believe me, her CV is very impressive. My research focus, uh, sorry, uh, her research focuses on understanding the molecular mechanism of protein and RNA translocation into mitochondria and how mitochondrial dysfunction contributes to this. I can't wait to listen to her, her talk, actually. And her laboratory has pioneer studies characterizing an oxidation reduction pathway for the import of proteins and pathway for the assembly of inner membrane proteins. And most recently, the, uh, her lab has been developing a chemical biology approach to develop new modulator for mitochondrial biogenesis. And there, uh, her lab also adapting zebra fish as a new model for mitochondrial diseases, which is an outstanding vertebrate model for testing small label modulators. So if I uh, summary uh, promise that it would be two major areas, understanding the mechanism of protein import into mitochondria and determining the process by which it affects in mitochondrial protein translocation lead to disease. So he ha uh, she has received numerous awards. Uh, many awards from, for her research, including an established investigator award from the American Heart Association, a Damon Renell Walter Winslow Scholar Award, a Beckman Young Investigator Award, and currently served on the Scientific Advisory Board of the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. Uh, she uh, also postdoc in Switzerland. In Basel, Switzerland, yeah, in Basel, in Biochemy Biocentrum, Basel, Switzerland. And uh, I can assure you, uh, her CV is very impressive and she is a very uh, inspiration for all of us, young generation of researcher. So without further ado, I invite Professor Dr. Carla Muller to join with me here and to give So I'd like to thank everybody for the kind invitation, especially, especially yeah. the students. Uh, this is quite an honor to be here today. We, I, can say that our students at UCLA are not so entertaining. We mostly want to know, what do I have to know for the exam? So I'd like to thank the students. Um, everything has been wonderful. They, they have organized my trip beautifully, and this is my first time in Indonesia. 
I've been a professor at UCLA for a long time. And I think what today I'll do before I start, I'd like to talk a little bit about science because I think everybody loves science. But I'd like to give you a little bit of my history and tell you how I got here because I think my story isn't that different than a lot of your stories. So when you heard my CV, it saw that I went to my, and finished my bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD at UCF at Iowa State University. I'm from a small town, a small um, rural area in Wisconsin, in the center of the United States. It's very cold there. Um, we need winter coats, and it's very cold to go outside. And I grew up on a dairy farm. I grew up milking cows, and I had a lot of hard work to do every day. Milk the cows twice a day, drive the tractor. And my parents didn't go to university, but they wanted their children to go to university. And so at a young age, I was um, instilled in me, study hard, get good grades, and go to school. And so at the time, I could have stayed in, uh, as a farmer in Wisconsin, but I decided I wanted to go to college. And at first, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but science was always what had thrilled me. I loved anything about cows. I loved all of the all of the science behind trying to milk cows. I know that sounds a, a little odd, but um, that was sort of my inspiration as a child. And so I decided to go to um, vet school. I wanted to be a veterinarian, and I wanted to do large animal medicine. And at the time, I was um, really excited about that. But also, when I started in my undergraduate studies, I found that I really loved metabolism. I loved metabolism, and I liked mitochondria. And from there, I started doing research. Again, just doing undergraduate research like you guys are doing here. And I was looking at various um, pathways at a very basic level. We had a lot of instrumentation at the university I was attending, so I got to learn a lot of basics. And then I started doing research at 3M. And 3M is a chemistry company in the United States. It's in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I became interested there in trying to develop artificial limbs, uh, limb support for humans. And that sort of got my interest peaked in um, doing basic research. But at the same time, I had really good grades and I got into vet school at, the uni at Iowa State University. And Iowa State University at the time had one of the best vet schools in the country. I was accepted with early admission. My grades were good and so I started there. And things were good about the first semester, but then I started realizing that this love that I had for metabolism was really strong. And I had a professor in biochemistry, not unlike Professor Usman, who got me interested in mitochondria. And I decided that I wanted to switch gears. I didn't see myself in 20 years uh, being a large animal veterinarian. I became more interested in research. And so I switched into a graduate program at Iowa State University. And for my master's, I looked at how mitochondrial DNA was inherited in dairy cattle. We developed a method to purify mitochondrial DNA from the white blood cells of cattle. We would go and take blood samples purify the, the mitochondrial DNA, we would sequence it, and we would do uh, prescription RFLP analysis on it. And I was really excited about that, but I also at the same time realized I wanted to work in a model organism. So I switched from my master's studies into my PhD studies, and I started working with the research model Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or the buddy yeast. And that's what's shown, that's what's shown on on the slide here. This is our um, research model, mainly in the laboratory, the buddy yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And I was interested in, searching, in switching it to a model organism because I thought that would fit with my research interests long term. Um, you know, I was really interested in the molecular basis of, of mitochondrial diseases, but it's really good to have some research model organisms to work in. And Saccharomyces at the time was an excellent model. And so I continued my PhD studies in another laboratory at Iowa State University, and I learned a lot of molecular biology, and that's where I really fell in love with the question of mitochondria and how do proteins get into mitochondria. And so from there, again, I'm sort of a small town child at this point. I have to go for, I want to go for my postdoctoral studies, and my choices were, at that point, go to the west coast of the, of the United States or the east coast of the United States, and I decided to go to Europe. 
And I went to a professor there named uh, Gottfried Schatz, or Jeff Schatz, because um, he was the best person in the world studying this, and I was really interested in this question. And luckily, I was accepted into his laboratory, and that's really where my postdoctoral studies started. And so from there, at that point, when I finished my postdoctoral studies, I wasn't still certain what I wanted to do. I was thinking potentially about a career in industry, but at the same time, I wanted to look into academics. And so I went on to the academic interviewing circuit, and I got a position at UCLA, and that's where I ended up. And so I've been a professor there since 1999, and I've really enjoyed it. I teach metabolism to our undergraduates at UCLA, who are similar to you guys. They have their exams in a week. I know I'm breaking up your exam schedule right now. But they're all interested in understanding basic metabolism and how it's important in our everyday life. And when I see all of you guys up here, I just want to say I hope that you know whatever you find your passion in research or in some aspect of science, that you work hard and try to follow it. You know, I've only been here a short time, but I'm talking to the professors, talking to some of the students. It's, it's amazing how quickly you connect with science. Science goes beyond all countries, beyond all political parties and everything. So I think what you're doing is great. And I want to encourage you to keep doing it. You know, everybody's got an interesting story about how they got there, but, you know, what it takes is hard work and passion, and I hope that you continue on this track. It seems like you have a really great program, and I've had a fun time in this, just in these couple short days seeing all of you guys. I had a nice tour of the library. It's a beautiful building, and this is a wonderful campus. I think you have a great environment here to learn. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the research that we do. We work on mitochondria. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And as we saw today from all the dancing, you guys have really good mitochondria. <laughs> and so mitochondria, this is the mitochondrial network that's lit up in the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Yeast is what we use to make bread and beer, and it's a single-celled organism. But it's really like a mini-me. It's everything that we need in one cell. And what we've done here is we've highlighted the mitochondria with green fluorescent protein, they're fluorescing. And what we see is that we've got a mother here and she's having a bud. And when we look at mitochondria, we like to use Saccharomyces as a model because the mitochondrial genome is not essential, but the organelle has to be inherited. And here you can see, this is the organelle being inherited into the daughter. The other thing also to notice is from our textbooks, we always see mitochondria as a little sausage. Well, they're really not. Instead, what we call this is a mitochondrial network, and the mitochondria are constantly undergoing vision and fusion. It's a very dynamic network. We think the purpose of some of this vision and fusion is to identify unhealthy mitochondria and subsequently remove them. So that is our work in our excitement, the mitochondria powerhouse of the cell. And if I can have the next slide. So this is what we see when we look in our textbooks, right? This is an electron micrograph of the mitochondria. We see we have an outer membrane and an inner membrane, which separate an intermembrane space from the matrix. And the inner membrane has lots of these imaginations, which are referred to as crispy. This is the site of energy production. This is where all the complexes are for respiration or oxidative phosphorylation. And so if you look in, within a cell, we'll see that the mitochondria are distributed throughout the cytosol of the cell. And when we look at this electron micrograph of the mitochondria, if we could count all the proteins, we would find that there are about 1,200 to 1,500 proteins that make up this organelle. And the mitochondria has its own small genome, which is going to code for a handful of those proteins. I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. But what we see is that most of these proteins that are going to come into mitochondria are going to be coded in the nucleus, they're going to be translated in the cytosol, and then they're going to be imported into mitochondria. And this process of import is very complicated and that's what's really been keeping me busy for the last 20 years.
So if I could have the next slide. So mitochondria started out as a bacteria, and during this process called endosymbiosis, became all the powerhouse of the cell. And we need mitochondria in a lot of tissues. There are a lot of mitochondrial diseases. The estimate is that one in every 5,000 children that's born is going to have a mitochondrial disease. But as diseases go, we find that there are broad spectrum. And so these are some of the examples of the various mitochondrial diseases that we've been studying. And we can see a common theme among these, dise among these diseases. Tissues that have high energy requirements are going to really depend upon their mitochondrial function. And so if we look at some of these tissues in the eye, we find that people with mitochondrial diseases often have blindness, or this, this phenomenon with the eyelid droops, the droopy eyelid. They also have problems with skeletal muscle. The muscles are weak. They don't have enough energy to support them. Walking and movement can be difficult. Diabetes is also linked to defective mitochondria. And then if we continue in the heart, they have a condition called cardiomyopathy. I'll show you a little bit about, more about that in detail. And then the nervous system. When we look at our nervous system, our neurons really depend upon mitochondria for energy, and defects in mitochondrial function often manifest as neural, as neural symptoms. And so what we're going to see is um, that a lot of these at a more molecular level are going to affect oxphos, and then defects in mitochondria can lead to early cell death, which is referred to as apoptosis, and we're going to have problems with controlling our metabolism when we have these mitochondrial diseases. And so this is a little bit of a closer look at some of these. A lot of these mitochondrial diseases manifest as cardiomyopathies. When we look at our cardiac tissue, we find the normal part has a certain thickness to the wall. But in some of these mitochondrial di diseases, the walls can become thickened. The reason for the thickening is that the mitochondria are trying to compensate and make extra energy. So the heart becomes so thick that it can no longer function. In other cases, the muscle wall is very thin and the heart does not pump well. And then the big, other big area that we find problems are in the neural system. And these are referred to as neuropathies and myopathies. And what happens in these diseases is that the nerves are not innervated correctly. There could be either an increased innervation in which we get something called dystonia, or we can have other problems in which the innervation is lacking. We get these things called ataxia or other movement disorders. So there's a broad spectrum of diseases that are caused by defects in mitochondria. And this is one of the reasons why, it's, as a researcher, it's a really good area to study. We're going to have a long way to go to get answers. But we are learning things, and so this is what makes it exciting. Next slide. So the mitochondria started out in the early days as a free living bacteria. It had its own genome and it lived in the wild, let's say. But what happened during endosymbiosis is the mitochondria became captured and during this development, a lot of the genes that were in this um, early mitochondria moved to the nucleus. But the mitochondria didn't give up all of its control. It kept its own genome. And this is a small genome. In, in our bodies, it's at 16.6 kilobases, and it's circular. We can think of it as a large plasmid. However, if you look at the mitochondrial genome in plants, and in our Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it looks much different. It's much larger in size, on the order of anywhere from 20 to 200 kilobases, and it also has a lot of extra DNA, and it contains introns. When we look at our mammalian mitochondrial genome, we find that there are a small number of genes. There are 37 genes. We find that of these, there are 22 tRNAs and two ribosomal RNAs. And so what happens in the mitochondrial matrix is it has its own transcription and translation system for a handful of polypeptides that become subunits in the oxidative phosphorylation complexes, okay? And what else is really interesting about our mitochondrial DNA is that it's maternally inherited. 
okay? So all of you guys out there, you better be nice to your mothers because they've given you your mitochondrial DNA, okay? And if we look in other organisms though, plants for example, we also see that inheritance of mitochondrial DNA is uniparental, but in some cases there it might be coming from the male. So this whole system, this developing this endosymbiosis, as you're starting to get an idea of, is very complicated. And then we start adding on to this. When we look at mitochondria, I showed you that first picture of the yeast mitochondrial network. There are certain points at which the mitochondrial DNA is kept. These are tethering points called nucleoids. And one mitochondria will have anywhere from 10 to 60 copies of mitochondrial DNA per genome. And if we start looking at a cell, depending upon the cell type, we can have anywhere from 1 to 2,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA up to 50 to 60,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA, okay? So this is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a bad thing if we want to do genetic engineering. We can do genetic engineering on our nucleus very easily because we have two copies of every gene. Well, mitochondria now, we've got to deal with maybe 50 to 100,000 copies of a genome that we have to change. So that's difficult. Um, the good thing, though, can be perhaps that we have many genomes, so we have a less likelihood, potentially, of getting uh, certain mutations that might impair mitochondrial function. And what we find, then, with these um, multiple copies is that in most people, we find that there's pretty much one copy of your mitochondrial genome, and it exists throughout the whole cell. This is referred to as homoplasmy. But in other types of mitochondrial diseases, we can have more than one type of mitochondrial genome, and this is called heteroplasmy. I'll talk about this in the next couple of slides, but it's when we have this heteroplasmy that we start to have these mitochondrial diseases. And in this heteroplasmy, what we're going to find is that there's going to be a threshold level. We're going to have a competition between good molecules of mitochondrial DNA and bad molecules. And at some point, a certain threshold of bad mitochondrial genomes is reached, and those bad mitochondrial genomes win, and the person develops a mitochondrial disorder. So on the next slide, please. And so some of these mutations and some of these genes lead to these different inherited diseases. And most of the mitochondrial diseases we find are caused by mutations in the tRNAs. And these lead to diseases such as uh, MALAS and MERC, which are referred to as mitochondrial encephalomyopathy. And then, when we look at the ribosomal RNAs, we also have some deafness which is associated with this. And this is typically seen in young children that are given some of these antibiotics, the immunoglycosides. Next slide, please. And so, I also talk about this heteroplasmy versus homoplasmy. In homoplasmy, what we find is the cell has one type of mitochondrial genome. That's what we all want. That's what a healthy cell looks like. But in some of these cases, we have this heteroplasmy situation. And again, this is maternally inherited. And there will be a balance. There will be a pool of good mitochondria, and then there's going to be a pool of bad mitochondria. And at some point, there will be a threshold that's reached where the number of bad mitochondrial genomes is, cannot be handled and it will lead to these mitochondrial diseases. And what we find in a lot of these, um, in a lot of these mitochondrial genomes is that they actually have large deletions, deletions of one little base or more. And it's thought that they might interfere with the normal replication and transcription system and that's why they become a problem. And some of these are referred to as cairn sayre syndrome. And a lot of times they're inherited, but sometimes they can be sporadic. And what happens is when we reach this critical threshold, we, have, we see that we have this mitochondrial myopathies. So what can we do with research right now? We've been thinking about ways in which we can edit the mitochondrial genome. But as I've said, this is really difficult. We have many copies of the mitochondrial genome. How do we repair all of them? Another technology that I've been working with in collaboration with a professor at UCLA is uh, a technology to take mitochondria from one cell and put it into another. 
We've been able to get this to work in cultured cells. Working on this as a treatment will take many more years, but it's, it's an approach that might work. And then what we're doing in my laboratory is we're trying to understand the pathway of how proteins are delivered with probably potentially using this as a therapeutic approach to treat some of those diseases. Next slide, please. So this is just a cartoon that shows the uh, organization of the oxidative phosphorylation complexes in the mitochondria. And what I want to point out here is that we have the mitochondrial polypeptides that are encoded by the mitochondrial genome. Those will result in some of the subunits for the membrane components of these oxidative complexes. And when we have mutations, we get a broad spectrum of mitochondrial diseases. But we also have the genes that are coming from the nucleus. These proteins are also just as important to assembly of the mitochondria and to overall function. And mutations in the nuclear genes have also been linked to a large number of mitochondrial diseases. And so just shown here in blue, we can see that some of these uh, mitochondrially encoded, uh, nuclear encoded subunits, when we have mutations, again, can lead to diseases that are often referred to as Lay syndrome or cardiomyopathies. And when we look at these respiratory complexes, they're very complex machines. Complex one, the NAD, DH dehydrogenase has six subunits that come from the mitochondrial genome, but another 45 components that come from the nuclear genome. So we've got about 52 proteins that have to work together. And then when we go into complex three and complex four, again, we're looking at more than 10 proteins that have to work together for this meta metabolic process to work, okay? So that's sort of the introduction that I want to give you on mitochondria. Hopefully, I haven't lost you all. You're not falling asleep. Hopefully, my speaking is clear enough. I don't know if anybody has any questions right now if they would like to ask. Where's the exit? We saw in our safety videos that we know where it is. OK, so we work at how the question, how do proteins get into mitochondria? So when we look at the mitochondria, I don't know if any of you guys ever run protein gels out there. Mitochondria are pretty easily to purify, and if you run a Comassi gel, you see a lot of bands. And if we count them, if we use mass spectrometry, we count about 1,500 proteins, okay? 1,500 proteins, and then they have post-translational modification. It gets to be pretty complicated. And so what we find is that the mitochondrion has really these complicated translocation pathways to bring these proteins into mitochondria. So first of all, when the proteins that were originally in the bacteria moved into the nuclear genome, they had to develop targeting sequences that said go to mitochondria. It's like when you want to write a letter, you put an address on it. Please send to grandma. Please send to mom and dad, right? Well, these proteins had to put an address on that said go to mitochondria, okay? And so a lot of these mitochondria have targeting sequences sequences on the N terminus. We have an N terminal targeting sequence that says go to mitochondria. And then the mitochondria had to develop a way to bring these proteins in. The mitochondria basically had to develop a mailbox. And so they developed what we call as a translocation system. And we call the translocase of the outer membrane the Tom complex. Okay? We like to shorten things up and make them simple, make them easy to remember. So we talk about translocases on the outer membrane as TOMs. And it's not my boyfriend, okay, guys? <laughs> I promise. And then we have this translocation pathway called the SAM complex. Again, not my boyfriend. It's the sorting and assembly complex for beta barrel membrane proteins. Okay, what's a beta barrel membrane protein, you ask? You guys, do any of you guys have some bacterial studies during your training? If we look at the outer membrane of the bacteria, one type of structure they have are beta barrel proteins, okay? We have alpha helical and beta barrel. And, in, and if we look at us, we really have no beta barrel proteins. This is a, a, typically what we find in prokaryotes and plants. But what we found during this endosymbiosis is that we've kept three beta barrel proteins in mitochondria. One of them is called porin or VDAC. This is going to be what brings the metabolites across the outer membrane. And then one of the import components itself 
TOM40 is a beta barrel protein, and then one of the components of the SAM complex is a beta barrel protein. So we have three beta barrel proteins in the mitochondrial outer membrane. And this is, again, it's prokaryotic origin. And then the proteins come across the TOM complex, that'll get them into the intermembrane space. But we know that's not going to be good enough. We've got an inner membrane we have to reach, and we also have a matrix. So what we're going to see is that on the inner membrane, we have additional translocases, okay? And we call these translocates of inner membrane or TIM complexes. Again, not my boyfriend. But I really do like TIM complexes. If I did have a boyfriend, I think I would like them to be TIM. So if we look at these TIM complexes, the translocates of the inner membrane, the main component is a 23 kilodalton protein, so we call it TIM23. And then for the um, other translocon, which I'll be talking about in more detail, we have the TIM22 translocation of the inner membrane, a 22 kilodalton protein. In addition, we have some export pathways, and these, again, are found in bacteria as well. And these are going to be for the assembly of our oxfos complexes. So we have export complexes. So we've got these mitochondrial proteins. They're going to be translated in the cytosol. And then they're going to come through the TOM complex. And then depending upon where the sorting information sends it, it will deal with the TIM23 and the TIM22 translocons. Next slide. This is a look at the TIM23 translocon in more detail. It's a complicated system, but we can simplify it. So these proteins shown in blue here, TIM17, 23, and TIM50, have two functions. One is to function as a receptor to bring the precursor from the TOM complex to the TIM22 complex. So these proteins that are coming into the mitochondria, we call them precursors because they haven't re reached their final destination. They come across the TOM complex, and then this is this typical N-terminal targeting sequence that says go to mitochondria, and this says go to matrix. And then we use the TIM17 and 23 and TIM50 to start the initial steps of bringing this protein in, okay? We find that 50 functions as a receptor, and then TIM17 and TIM23 actually form a translocation channel, okay? And from there, the precursor comes across into the matrix. And then we have to have a motor, we have to have a motor to pull this precursor in, and we use a chaperone called HSP70, and we use some additional proteins to pull this precursor into the matrix, okay? And then from there, we have processing peptidases, which will remove the N-terminal targeting sequence, and then it will fold and reach the correct location. These are a lot of proteins to study, but what we find is this is really an important complex. If we delete any of these proteins, we find that the Saccharomyces as our research model organism dies. So we say that these proteins are essential for viability. And that brings up an important question. Why do we need mitochondria? Well, we all know we need them for energy production, but in Saccharomyces, you can get rid of your mitochondrial genome and they're just fine. There are some fundamental processes in mitochondria that we can't do without. One is the synthesis of iron sulfur clusters. We need iron sulfur clusters in heme. These are made in mitochondria. And then also the assembly of the organelle, protein import. So these are the two essential functions, okay? So the mitochondria is a complicated organelle. A lot of groups have been studying it for quite some time. And just as we thought we had everything figured out, it still has become more complicated. Next slide. This is the pathway that I discovered as a, as a postdoctoral fellow. Who would have thought that I would have identified something new? But we did, and it was really exciting. And so this pathway is called the TIM22 pathway, and this is for the import of precursor proteins into the inner membrane. So these proteins end up in the inner membrane and are important for the assembly. So some of these proteins include the ADP, ATP translocator, the uncoupling protein, and members of the mitochondrial carrier family. And when we look at this pathway, 
we see that it's a little bit different than the TIM23 pathway. First of all, we have some small TIM proteins in the intermembrane space, and they assemble as hexamers. And then they bind to the precursor as it comes into the intermembrane space, and then they take it to an insertion complex, which consists of TIM22, and this mediates assembly of this protein into the inner membrane, okay? And as a, as a postdoctoral Sorry about that, guys, you're awake. <laughs> so as a postdoctoral fellow, what was also really excited is that we identified the first disease caused by a defect in protein import. Mutations in the protein TIM8 lead to a disease called deafness dystonia syndrome. So patients that had a mutation in this gene had symptoms of deafness, blindness, and a movement disorder called dystonia. And it was genetically inherited and it was rare. But it gave us our first insight into how these import pathways were important in our everyday survival. Next slide. And then in the latest chapter that we've identified is there's still another level of organization here. These are these small tin proteins. They're imported into the intermembrane space and they acquire disulfide bonds. So I don't know if you guys remember some of your chemistry. There's a lot of redox chemistry going on in mitochondria and there are proteins that assemble and form these disulfide bonds. And this was unexpected at the time because we thought this was a reducing environment. But we identified a new pathway for import. Next slide. And that shows you again how complicated this pathway is. And so what we've been working on is we've been showing that as these proteins come in, they're unfolded, they acquire disulfide bonds, and then we go through a disulfide relay. So MIA-40 is an oxidoreductase, it will insert the disulfide bonds into these. And then we have a sulfhydro oxidase that will recycle Earth via 40. And then we'll send our electrons off to the electron transport system, okay? So as you can see, we have these complicated import pathways. But we can simplify it. We have a Tom complex on the outer membrane. On the inner membrane, we have a TIM23 and a TIM22 pathway. And this pathway that we call here is the MIA pathway. So it's going to be today about Tom, Tim, and Mia, okay? My best friends, not my boyfriend, okay? So next slide, please. So why do we want to manipulate myocondrial protein transportation? Well, there's a lot of diseases that are caused by either a defect in protein import or maybe too much protein import. And so what we started to do in my laboratory to see if we can use a chemical biology approach to understand how proteins are imported and then potentially develop therapeutics for treating some of these diseases. And I want to tell you a story about how we've gone about this, okay? And so we have this wonderful chemical bi um, screening facility at UCLA. We have a library of about 200,000 compounds and we have robots, and so we've designed a variety of chemical screens, and I'll give you the highlights of some of these. And in doing that, we developed inhibitors for the TOM and the TIM23 translocation pathway, TIM22, MIA, and some of our processing proteases in the mitochondrial matrix, okay? So next slide, please. And so we've taken a couple of different approaches. In one case, we'll do what we refer to as in vitro small molecule screens. And that's something that you guys have probably done already, you just don't know that you're doing it. So we just take a recombinant protein, because some of these mitochondrial components have assays that we can develop. They have biochemical or enzymatic assays. And one of these proteins that we've done this with is this sulfhydrooxidase ERV1. ERV1 will take a non-physiological substrate, such as DTT, and oxidize it, and then it'll give off hydrogen peroxide, and we can measure this in a chemical assay. And so we've taken advantage of some of these subunits which have an enzymatic activity to develop a small molecule screen. Basically, we put one enzyme in a tube, 
we add the substrate, we add the small molecules, and we look for small molecules that inhibit this reaction, okay? And that's worked really well for us. I mean, how hard is it to mess up putting one, two, one protein in a tube, right? You only got one thing to look at. It's, it's a good screen designed for any of my undergraduates, right? There's only one thing they have to look at. It's a yes or a no. So that's worked really well for us. But the problem with that is we know it works really well in the tube. When we go to look at it in the cell, it doesn't always work. And so trying to figure out if these small molecules would work in our research organisms is a little bit more difficult. The other type of screen that we've done are small molecule screens, again, in Saccharomyces, and we take advantage of using the entire organism. And so I'll give you some examples of that, but what we've been able to do in this is it's advantageous because we can get, we can get small molecules that can target an entire protein import pathway, but the potential problem is we don't know where. So we try to figure out, using all of our biochemical approaches, where the small molecule is working, okay? So next slide, please. And so this is an example of our screening facility at UCLA. This is one of the robots. We have this automated system here. This is the robot's arm. We do our screens in 384 well plates. The graduate students set it up. The robot will take the plate to the different stations a plate where it will pin in the yeast, another place where it will pin in the compound. And the students learn a lot of biotechnology. They spend most of their day babysitting the robot because the robot doesn't always behave. Sometimes he wants to take a break. But it's pretty straightforward and it's, it's a nice uh, a, a opportunity for our students to learn some new technology. So we have these automated screens with, um, at UCLA in a screening facility that we've used to identify our small molecules. And so this is an example of how we've done the screen, okay? This is our Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it's a budding yeast. Just like we use plasmids with antibiotic markers in bacteria when we do cloning, with yeast we use oxytrophic markers. So we use metabolic markers to control them. And in this case, Saccharomyces can normally make their own uracil. And in this uracil biosynthetic pathway, the protein lives in the cytosol, okay? And when, the, when the, this protein is in the cytosol, the yeast are able to grow in media lacking uracil. So what we did is we put a mitochondrial targeting sequence on, we sent this into the mitochondrial matrix, and we see now that the yeast are not able to grow in media lacking uracil. So then what we did is we just did a simple, we asked a simple question, if we put small molecules on, can we get small molecules that inhibit protein translocation now and allow the yeast to grow in media lacking uracil? Next slide, please. And the answer is yes, we've been able to identify small molecules. And so this is an example of how we have optimized the screen. So we have this protein called SU9, this is a targeting sequence from year of three. And this is in our wild type yeast. We see that it goes to mitochondria. And if we do an immunoblot with it, this is where the mature form of the protein is. However, if we have a mutant that is de defective in protein import, a TIM23 mutant, we find that the full length form accumulates, here it's marked with a P for precursor, and now the strain is able to grow in media lacking uracil because our protein is stuck out in cytosol. And so what we want to do is we want to optimize the screen, and what we do is we want to make sure that the that this import pathway is very efficient. And so we just ask the question, if we have media lacking uracil, and then we start to add it in, do we have a condition where the yeast don't grow, and then when they start to grow? And what we find is that when we add uracil at about 0.1 mg per liter, the yeast start to grow, okay? So this indicated that we had a really good basis for a screen and we proceeded. Next slide. And so this is an example of what these 384 well plates look like. Luckily, the students don't have to pipette this by hand all day. If they did, I'm sure they wouldn't be in my lab, okay? They can do this with the robot, 
And what we do on one side is we put a negative control. This is just the vehicle which carries our small molecules, PMSO. And then on the right side, we have an uncoupler, CCCP. This will uncouple the mitochondria and inhibit protein import. And we see here that they grow. And then we find that we have three wells here in which our yeast are growing. And this indicates that we have small molecules that potentially inhibit protein translocation. Okay? And so we analyze these and we have statistics to see if we have a good screen. And the statistical value is referred to as a Z prime. And when we have a Z prime with a score of 0.5 or greater, that means that we have a robust screen. And what we find here is that our score is 0.9. So we have a really good screen. So next slide. So we start then to analyze the small molecules to try to figure out where they work. And this is where we do a lot of biochemistry. And um, these are different assays that the students do at the bench in the laboratory. So what we can do is we can purify mitochondria. So we purify mitochondria from our saccharomyces and we can freeze them, okay? We freeze them and take them out of the, out of the freezer as we need them. And then we can do what we refer to as protein import assays. So we can take a protein, in this case we have SU9, which is a targeting subunit, a mitochondrial targeting subunit that says go to matrix, and we fuse it with dihydrofolate reductase, which is a reporter protein. It's kind of like green fluorescent protein for these import assays. We make this in our reticulocyte lysate system, and then we can import it into mitochondria. And what we find over time is that some of it becomes imported into mitochondria, but not all of it is imported because this process isn't very efficient. So what we do is we add protease to remove all of the species that is not imported into mitochondria. And this is what this assay looks like. So we've run a gel to separate the imported proteins and we've made our SU9 DHFR, this is the precursor form, and then we get the mature form, as it is imported into mitochondria, the N-terminal targeting sequence will be cleaved, and we can see that we accumulate the mature form. And then these are some of the small molecules that we identified, mitoblock 10 and mitoblock 11. And what we find is that if we add these in our import assay, we find that the amount of mature precursor decreases. So over time, these molecules are able to block the import of these precursors into mitochondria, and we're able to decrease import. We also notice that there's a precursor form that does seem to accumulate here. We think that it's actually stuck in the TIN23 translocon, so it's sitting in the mitochondria, but it's not able to completely reach the matrix where it will be processed by these processing proteases, okay? So these were the first two molecules we found from the screen, and my students were really excited because they actually had some results at this point, right? It wasn't just running a screen, but then you get the results. Next slide, please. But these small molecules don't always behave as we think they will. A lot of times they can be toxic to mitochondria, and they can uncouple respiration, for example. And so here's an example of what we do to see if these, might, these small molecules might be toxic. We can take an oxygen electrode and add mitochondria, and then we give them a substrate, we feed them NADH, and the mitochondria will respire and they will consume oxygen. And then if we add an uncoupler so that the membrane potential is dissipated, they start to consume oxygen very quickly. So this is what a typical respiration curve looks like. And in the presence of NADH, we see that we have well-coupled mitochondria, okay? When we add DMSO, we see that the rate of respiration is not affected. And then when we add a small molecule, MB10, we see again that the rate of respiration is not affected. We found that about 20 to 30 percent of these small molecules actually uncouple mitochondria and we have to get rid of them. So a lot of these compounds, we might start out with a lot of hits, but by the time we narrow it down, we don't necessarily have 
So now I want to switch and give you a little bit of a story about how we're using these small molecules. I know you're probably tired of gels and assays and you know biochemistry. You want to test what you want to have a big show picture, right? I'm from Hollywood, Los Angeles. Where's the cure for the disease, right? Well, that's what we wanted to try to do. And so there was a rare disease called.